He's here along with our very own Pippa Stevens, who covers all things energy for us as well. Neil, I'll start with you. And um, is it a China story? Because if the U.S. is slowing, how do you get higher oil prices? Yeah, as, as we think about the range for oil prices over the next several years, we do believe in a higher for longer commodity environment. We, we think of the lower band being about $80 barrel Brent. That, that's uh, an environment where you go below it. You're going to disincentivize activity to meet the marginal unit of demand. When you get above $100 Brent on a sustained basis, you, you destroy demand on the other side of it. So $80 to $190 at the midpoint. If you look at the forward curve, uh, out the curve through the end of the decade, it's in the low to mid 70s. So we think the forward curve needs to roll up. And as that happens, we think energy equities can perform well. As it relates to China, I do think China right now uh, is bouncing around uh, 14 and a half million barrels a day of oil demand. It's on its way up to 15 and a half million barrels a day. That increase of a million barrels a day of demand typically equates to $15 on price. So that should be a supportive factor as you work your way through 2023. Wow. And again, right now, we've already seen gasoline prices, Pippa, as you know, go up, I think, what is it, 30 cents mm -hmm. or so from the lows. Um, so what Neil's talking about is not catastrophic, but it would add to more pressure on anyone on the uh, sort of flip side of these costs. Exactly. And we'll see that in the upcoming inflation report, because that was such a big driver of December's numbers coming down. And if we no longer have that to rely on, then what does that mean for the economy more broadly. And I think that we also have all these catalysts still coming up, like the ban on Russian products, that the market is kind of not really anticipating or factoring in to the degree that maybe it should be. And it seems like because there wasn't an initial drop off in Russian production, maybe the market thinks it's not going to be as severe as those initial forecasts back in March of last year. But the thing is that they're still working their way through the market. And over the longer term, this will meaningfully reshape the energy market. So prices have come down, but there are still a lot of unknowns. It's a great point. It's sort of the difference between headline timing and actual implementation. Yeah. And Neil, all of this said in sort of the macro case for energy, it's still, you see some differentiation here. You're bullish uh, more so on Exxon and Conoco than on Chevron. I don't know if you can kind of talk to why. And nat gas, meanwhile, we've seen prices collapse. Yeah. yeah as we think about the big oils, they tend to trade uh, with a lot of dispersion. That's what makes uh, it such a fun space to cover. From 2014 to 2016, you had Chevron materially outperform, or Exxon materially outperformed Chevron. From 2016 to 2020, you had uh, Chevron materially outperform Exxon. In the last two years, you've seen Exxon do better. We think the ingredients of that continued outperformance of Exxon are still in place. A management and board turnaround. A, uh, a significant amount of cash going back to shareholders. You heard Pippa talk about the tightness that we're seeing in the refining markets. That bodes well for Exxon Mobil, which is legacy standard oil, has 5 million barrels a day a refining capacity, and they have very differentiated upstream projects, particularly in Guyana, which continues to grow. It's going to grow from about 0.4 million barrels a day to 1.3 million barrels a day by early next decade. It's a very unique project at a time where the world doesn't have enough long lead time projects. So Exxon, to us, represents one of the most interesting big oils, even after the outperformance.